missed you last week, but I would have done you no benefit as I could not talk. So, you're w welcome, I guess. I don't really know. Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, good to be with you this morning. Uh, over the last several weeks, if you guys have been with us, we've been talking through Acts chapter 2, the last part of Acts chapter 2, and what it looks like to be the church and what that first church that we find in Acts really was devoted to and what they, they really dedicated their lives to. And, and if we could just recap that for just a minute, week one, two weeks ago, uh, we kind of laid the foundation that church is for everybody. Church is for everybody, not just for me, not just for people like me, but God's church, God really desires for his church to be for everybody. That was two weeks ago. So how we look at church needs to reflect our desire to have church for every person. And last week, thanks to Don, we looked at four different areas where this group in Acts chapter 2 really focused themselves as they were following God. And so we looked at four different areas. They, they dedicated themselves to teaching, to fellowship, to communion, and to prayer. We also established last week that, that when we talk about church and we talk about how they, the church, dedicated themselves to these things and the church dedicated them, themselves to being for everybody, what we really mean is that the people in the church dedicated themselves to this. That it really is a personal thing. It, it, it's not the institution, it's not the organization, it really is, you know, everybody kind of had this focus, everybody made these things priority, and so, you know, we're going to continue this on as we look some more into Acts chapter 2, and so if you have your Bibles, you want to turn to Acts chapter 2, we're just going to reread this if you've been with us uh, the last couple weeks, we've read this the last couple weeks, and we're going to do so again, and we're going to focus on verse 43, but let's, let's read the whole thing starting in verse 41 says this, so those who accepted his message were baptized, and in that day about 3,000 people were added to them, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That's where we were last week. Here's where we're going to camp today. Then fear came over everyone, and, and many wonders and signs were being performed by the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple complex. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and humble attitude, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. And so, you know, if we could go back to verse 43, thanks, Lynette. We, we see, then fear came over everyone and many wonders and signs were being performed by the apostles. The apostles, these guys were the disciples that we read about in the Gospels. These are the guys that, that were following Jesus for three years. They were called by Jesus to, to follow him, and, and, and then Jesus equipped them over the three years, and they started doing ministry with Jesus, and then, and then Jesus was sending them out now to lead the church. And so that's, that's these guys. These are normal guys. These are, these are really just average guys. They were, they were fishermen. They were tax collectors. They were common average Joes when Jesus first called them to follow him, and none of this change from that point in their life to this point in their life, that just didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen with a snap of the finger. That took, you know, three, over three years uh, of, of following Jesus and them growing and them learning from Jesus. Because the reality is, is that they experienced life change to get to where they were now, to where we're talking about now. These guys just didn't automatically get to this point to where they were leading a church and, and doing signs and wonders and miracles in front of everybody. This, this didn't just happen overnight. So over the course of several years that they spent with Jesus, they grew into this. And so we're going we're gonna to dive in this morning to, to really what is ch change that Jesus is, is talking about for them and what is he talking about for us. Because it's really, I think a lot of times we like to look at, at, at change kind of like an instant thing, where really it needs to be like, if, if you're going to make a New Year's resolution, yeah, I've made New Year's resolutions before, I'm sure you probably have too, transformation in that does not happen overnight, does it? I didn't wake up on January 1st and all of a sudden, you know, really want to go to the gym every single day all of a sudden, just automatically. It didn't happen, although Joe would really like me to do that, but, um, <laughs> but it, it takes time. This is a transition in our lives. 
It doesn't just ha- automatically happen overnight. Change that we want to see come in our lives takes time because we have to recreate something. Something old has to leave us. Something bad has to leave, and we have to replace that with something new. And this is what Christ wants for us as well. He wants to recreate us through him. He wants to change who we are at our core because of him. And so this morning we're going to look at three principles about change that I think, that I think God wants to see in us. And we're going, to, we're going to start with this. Change starts with a new life. Change starts with a new life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Paul says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and look, new things have come. At the heart of the Christian faith, at the heart of following Jesus, is change. It isn't about making a New Year's resolution that's just going to die off two days later, or it's not about turning over a new leaf and suddenly everything becoming different. It's about living out a new life that's being changed on an ongoing basis by Jesus. And there's this need for something to pass away in us, the old part of us, the, the sinful part of us, the fleshy part of us that you read about in in the New Testament, that needs to pass away, that needs to move on, and something new, something better, needs to take its place. And sometimes we misunderstand how change works, and how that works with God. Sometimes I think we say, if I change, then God will like me more. And sometimes we say, if I can just be better, then God will bless me, or God will love me. And these are false. These are are not correct misunderstandings. Some seek change simply through obedience to God, and that's just not it. Timothy Keller once said this. He said, religion says this, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. But Christianity, following Christ, says I'm accepted, therefore I obey. Our acceptance and our change is affected by the work that Jesus did on the cross and him walking out of that grave three days later. Our acceptance and our change is affected by what Christ did for us on the cross. His work causes my acceptance before God. And everything else is really unsuccessful. Turning over a new leaf, making a resolution to change, really is just temporary. It can be frustrating when the results don't then get, we don't get the results that we want. And so in the Old Testament, if you remember the guy named Solomon, the Old Testament, we can read, he struggled with change as well. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 12 through through 18 talks about this struggle that he had with change in his life. He says this, Solomon says, I, the teacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to seek and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven. God has given people this miserable task to keep them occupied. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun and have found everything to be futile. The pursuit of the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have amassed wisdom far beyond those who uh, were over Jerusalem before me. And my mind has thoroughly grasped wisdom and knowledge. I applied my mind to know wisdom and knowledge. Madness and folly, I learned that this too is a pursuit of of the wind. For with much wisdom is much sorrow. As knowledge increases, grief also increases. He had access, Solomon had access to anything that he wanted. He was the wisest man possibly in history. He's arguably the richest man still in history. He had anything he wanted. He had power, and yet still, he could not get his mind wrapped around this. He still couldn't do more than just chase the wind. He needed something more to grant something new in him rather than just the same old thing over and over again. We need to give up on trying to change our own lives. We need to give up on trying to influence this change ourselves without God. We need to give ourselves over to God's work and grant to grant us new life. This can only come from him. In John chapter 3, the story of Nicodemus, you may be familiar with this, religious leader of the, of the day in the Jewish religious comes to Jesus to seek after this change. And Nicodemus, if you know anything about him, he had everything. He had everything he ever wanted. He, he had the right ancestors, the right, uh, the right parents and grandparents. He had the right spiritual training. He had the right position in society. He had everything. 
and by the religious standards, he had gained everything that he could gain, and yet there was still something that he desired more. He still desired real transformation, real change, because Jesus said, you have not been born again. He didn't need more rules. He didn't need more regulations. He probably followed them all anyway, and they didn't gain him anything. They didn't grant him anything. He, he needed life change. So rules and regulations don't bring about new life. They can only modify behavior, but not bring new life. He needed life change that could only come from God. Principle number two, change is a process. No one ever becomes everything God has called them to be this side of eternity. You know, if you've been following God very much at all, you know that to be true. This is a process that takes the, the rest of our life to become who he desires for us to be. Our life is just one of, of growth. God shapes our life over time in order to reflect and mirror Jesus. Paul writes this, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul says this, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God started a good work in us. If you are following Jesus, he has started that change in you, and it will be completed on the day that we get to be up in heaven with Jesus. But until that day, this is an ongoing work of change in our lives. Change happens at the moment of salvation, but then it continues on as we become more like Christ day after day as we continue to allow him to convict us and grow us. Second Peter chapter 2, chapter 1, excuse me. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4, continues on with this. It says, by these he, meaning Jesus, has, has granted us very great and precious promises so that uh, through them you might share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires. You know, if you really look at this verse, <clears throat> you realize that God's getting the, the, the bad end of this deal. He's, God desires to share his divine nature with us. He desires for us to be like him, to be able to reflect him. And yet you look at this and you go, God doesn't get anything out of this deal. God doesn't gain anything from, from me sharing in his divine nature. And so it is humbling for me. And it should be humbling for us to realize God desires for us to be like him. God desires to share his, his divine nature, his characteristics with us. And we get to reflect him. Because of God's love, he desires to share himself with me. He desires to share his character with me. God sets our lives in a new direction by replacing our human desires with his divine nature, with sharing himself. Our significance then is us reflecting his glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. With all, we all with unveiled faces are are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. We get to reflect God's glory by catching a glimpse of him. We get to reflect God's glory to the world around us by him growing us, by him, him changing us, by him uh, removing the old from us and replacing it with new. When believers set their eyes on God, their life is in the process of transformation. And we get to, get to be changed into who he desires for us to be. For the amount of time we have on this earth, we get to reflect God to the dark world around us. But, but we have to be sure of one thing. We have to be sure that the world does not get in the way of us reflecting God. We have to be sure that the world does not inch its way back into our life, getting in the way of us reflecting who God desires for us. And so as we continue on in this process, we have to, be careful that the stuff of earth becomes uh, less and less instead of more and more in our life. And as we reflect him more and more and as we continue to let him grow in us, we begin to think less and less of everything else. Principle number three, change involves letting go. Change involves letting go. Call, God calls us to change. If you're a Christ follower here, God has called you to, to allow him change your life. He calls us to be, he says things like, be holy as I am holy. And that sounds like an impossible task. But it's possible when we get out of the way and allow God to change us. And so when we move from the religious behavior to actual spiritual acceptance of God's work, this begins to happen. 
Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, 20 through 24, Paul says this. He says, but that is not how you learned about the, the Messiah, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him because the truth is in Jesus. You took off your former, former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires. You're being renewed in the spirit of your mind. You put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of, tru of the truth. Putting, on, putting off the old man and putting on the new man has its struggles. Leaving behind what is familiar and comfortable is difficult. Even if the better way, the new way, is better for us. We resist change. We resist change because we're humans. And humans struggle with change. Change is difficult for people because we are stubborn people. Change is difficult for people because we're stubborn. I have toddlers. I understand what it's like trying to get them to do something they don't want to do. It's near impossible. And maybe you can relate to that. But we are just like that sometimes. When we don't want to do something that we know we should, we get stubborn, we get bullheaded, and we fight it, we push against that. The same thing is true for when we are, are challenged to change and God's challenging us to grow and to change. We get stubborn, we hold on to things that we don't like to give up because we're stubborn. Change is difficult for people because we hold on to things. We have those things in our life that we like to keep a tight grip on, things that we don't like to give up. We have hobbies, we have preferences, we have pride, we have whatever it may be, the things that, that God is trying to grow in us and change us, we like those things sometimes. And so we keep, we keep a tight grip on those things and, and don't like giving those up. And this can keep a person from the new life that Christ wishes for them. Change is difficult for people because, frankly, we get comfortable in the way that we're doing things or the way that we are living our life. We all have those things in our life that we hold on to because we like them or because we like how our life is going or because they're familiar, familiar or comfortable. We get comfortable in sin. We start to justify sin in our mind. We start to, to talk it away like it's not a big deal. But sin can keep us from growing in our relationship with God, and so we get comfortable with it and we hold on to it. Change is difficult for people because we get afraid of change. Fear of the unknown, fear of not knowing what this is going to look like, fear of, of not knowing how he's going to change my life, where he's going to take me, what he's going to do with me, that is scary. And so fear can, take, can keep us from, from allowing ourselves to be changed and allowing ourselves to be led by God. Not knowing what this will look like in our life, not knowing what he, what he will ask from us causes us to shy away. And it can paralyze believers from fully embracing the new life that they have. And finally, I think change is difficult for people because regardless of what it is, change hurts sometimes. Change hurts. Change is hard. Leaving our comfort zones is hard. Giving up something that we've had a certain way for a long time is hard. But God wants to change us into something new and into something better. And so for that, in order to gain that, change is required. This, the extent of change God wants for us is worth working through and fighting through the struggle and the, the hardship and the, the comfortableness that we are used to. And so church, I think we have to get our mind wrapped around what this looks like. I think as, as we're diving into what the first church looks like, we have, to, we have to allow ourselves to embrace that God wants something different for us. And God wants something better for us. And that starts, like we talked about last week, on an individual level. We can say church needs to be about life change and that is right and that is true but that starts with us and it really starts with am I allowing myself to be changed am I allowing God to change me because it starts with us and so as we continue on this and as we go to whatever is next in this week for us we really have to ask the question am I allowing God to change my life am I allowing his spirit to convict me and to grow me and to challenge me in certain areas that I need to let go of this is foundational for us. The church that we read about in Acts chapter 2, they had life change. Things was, people's lives were changing there because they were allowing themselves to be convicted and changed by God. And so as we go into this time of worship and communion again, finishing out this service, I, I just want us to be thinking about what, what are some things that we're holding on to in our lives that, that 
that God is desiring for us to let go of. Maybe it's sin, maybe it's a certain way of doing things, maybe it's not allowing him control of our life. I, you know, I don't know what it is, but I think we all have those areas of our life where, where we just hold on to things. We hold on to a certain way of doing things, and we don't allow God to change our life. And so I encourage us to just consider that as we move on in this service, as we continue to worship, as we go to communion and recognize what Christ did for us on that cross. What are those things that we hold on to? What life change have you been resisting in your life? And maybe today is the day that you allow God to, to really change that in you. Let's pray. God, uh, I'm thankful again just for this day. Thank you that um, we get to come here and that we get to open your word for just a few minutes. And Father, I think for every one of us, I think for myself, we get in a mode of doing things, in a way of, of living life, and even in a way of, of being a Christian that, becomes routine and becomes normal and and there's not really any conviction in that we get in a place to where we just kind of go through the motions we just kind of do our thing and and don't really listen for your voice don't really look for your leading in our life but father i know that you desire for each one of us to continue to grow into the people you desire for us to be to to grow into a reflection of you and so father this morning, I just pray that, that you would be working in us, that you would be speaking to us individually. Identify that one thing in us, that one next thing that we need to do, that one next thing that we need to let go of, that one next thing that we need to allow you to, to replace with something better. Father, and then give us the, the courage and the, and the wisdom to know how to do that and where to go next. Father, again, we just thank you in your son Jesus' name.